All right, we are kicking off, kicking off about now. Yeah, kicking off now. Okay, I'll bring the little thing up on the screen. And we are going to make this work. How are we for volume, guys? Is that better? Excellent. This, I swear, is the point in the semester where things start being fun. I know you don't believe me. You probably won't believe me by the end of this lecture, but it genuinely is interesting because this is where things crystallize and you're reaching this point with your contract learning where the stuff is actually useful. And it sounds a little bit silly. It's all supposed to be useful. Yeah, yeah when you're learning the elements of a contract, it takes a long time before the elements of a contract at the very start, you know, the start of first semester, really crystallizes into something where you can rock up and you know, go to, in theory, go to court. In theory from this point, once you finish this module, you can go and at least have a solid uh, understanding of the common law and um, statutory provisions of, of contract law. Be able to do stuff in court. So the, I, I guess it's kind of the, really the rest of the um, rest of this course is is about discharge. It just sounds terrible out of context, but it's about contracts coming to an end. And that the, if we think of the four. I guess there's four areas of contract law that we've had. First two halves of contract one, and the first half of contract two. The first, first one is formation, when contracts come together, and you had to talk about the elements and how these things are actually made, how they come together. And then, it's a little bit of a dogfight for the second module, where we're talking about terms. So once a contract's come together, what does that actually mean in terms of what the parties promise to each other? And we talk about implied and expressed terms and um, statements made in around time of formation, contractual intention, all that stuff. Trying to work out what a contract is made up of. Um, this third clump was the vitiating factors. So all of the things that we've learned and you guys have assessed on, which is really mechanisms where you can go and bring actions to try and undo contracts, trying to actually somehow vitiate them, to stop them from having some sort of legal effect. Um, escape clauses, essentially, how you get out of it. But the most important way of getting out of contracts is when the obligations themselves are discharged. And the most straightforward one of those that we're going to talk about today is discharge by performance. And that, in its simplest sense, is the two sides of a contract doing what they said they're going to do. And the contract comes to an end. And this is really what this is about. And so I, I mentioned earlier that there's, there's not very many slides here um, because there are actually lots of ways contracts can come to an end. And the, this is just the simplest one. Both sides rock up, do what they said they're going to do, and then go home. It's done. It's over. It ends. And so that's this, you hear this phrase, discharge by performance, and we're going to talk about the rules for how this actually happens. Because like anything we do in law, it starts off simple. Both sides does what they said they're going to do. How hard is that? Mm, well, the devil's in the details. Um, and so I'll talk about that, starting with um, some of these cases can be quite sad, but the rules and principles you get out of this, you can walk away from this class, and it actually can impact your life. Maybe not this particular one, but the idea of dealing with contracts on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of what the courts do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so the starting point is as basic as it sounds. If both sides do exactly what they promised to do, and they both performed, the contract ends. It is discharged. It sounds really, really simple. In theory, and the way they say it, in practice, mm, end up with some, some slight, slightly strange results. And so we'll start with Cutter and Powell. That was uh, a case involving boats, as many of these old cases do. But in particular, it actually involved a crewman on the boat. And the boat was to go from Jamaica to Portsmouth. It might be Plymouth, but I think it was Portsmouth. In, in the UK, to go to England anyway. And the person was to be paid quite a good sum of money, 30 guineas, I think it was, which is a really good wage. Um, and the contract said, you go from Jamaica 
act as second mate from Jamaica to Portsmouth, you'll get 30 days. Not a problem, it makes sense. Just act as second mate, go the whole distance, get your 30. What was the problem? Well, three quarters of the way through, he died. And so that it wasn't, the, um, wasn't him trying to claim the 30 guineas, it was the poor wife who rocks up to the docks and not only does she have a dead husband, she sort of said, well, you know, where's the money? Well, the people who had the boat said, well, he didn't, he didn't complete the voyage. This contract says, you, you know, you, being the de deceased, had to be second mate from Jamaica to Portsmouth. Didn't do that. This is an entire obligation. And in that situation, exact performance should be required. Well, anyway, that's what was argued. And of course, she rocked up to court, as you can imagine. It was a large sum of money in those days. And you could also imagine that if your husband just died, and this is late 1700s, there's your source of income as well. Um, pretty troubling. And, you know, the courts of common law being those great arbiters of fairness and justice and, uh, and uh, the, the finders of fair and equitable solutions to things. What happened? They said, um, no. No, you aren't going to get it. Why? It was an ex it, this particular contract required exact performance. Not only are we not going to give you full amount, we're not even going to give you 75%. So Cutter and Powell is famous for being, the, I guess, the shining example of a contract where the particular terms of it say exact performance is required and deviations from that are going to render. Yeah, <laughs> you'd be a little bit angry about it, I imagine. Yeah. Uh, that's right, and they didn't do pro rata, didn't say that, it was an exact contract. And as such, she got nothing. Now, that's the starting point. Um, and that contrasted a little bit with the next case, which is not, strictly speaking, a rule just in contract law. It's the de minimis non curat lex rule. And it goes like this. The, the, the key proposition there is the law does not concern itself with trifles. Um, because in Shipton Anderson and Wheel Brothers, this involved a large shipment of wheat. And we're talking oh, something crazy. It was like 1,100 tons of wheat. And the clause said the person supplying the wheat could be plus or minus, I think it was 8%, plus or minus 8%, all right? Uh, and if they supplied the extra 8%, they'd be paid for it. Okay, that, that's fine. And um, it also said that even taking that into account, the amount of wheat can still be plus or minus 2%, and with no payment required, just plus or minus, because when you're measuring these things, you're going to have some difference. So it was 11 1,100, I believe it was, it might have been 11,000. It was a huge sum of wheat, thousand, well over 1,000 tons of wheat. And the amount that was delivered was just, it was, it had, they used the extra 8%, and then it was, they had the extra 2%, which meant it would have been about 1,210 tons or something along those lines. Anyway, <laughs> what had happened was the contract for wheat had been made a little while ago, and the price of wheat had plummeted. And so they could easily, the buyer could easily walk down the road and get wheat at a dramatically lower rate. So, <laughs> when the thing arrived, they measured it all, and it was like you said, it was 1,210 1, tons of wheat plus 25 pounds, which is about 10 kilos. Just over, the eight, you had the 8% and then had 2% of that, and they were... Yeah, about 10 kilos out of a, you have 1,100 tons or 11, 1,100 tons, you're 10 kilos over. And just to be clear, this wasn't to be paid for. This was just free wheat for the person, the buyer in this situation. It wasn't formed, it was just part of the variance that they'd already mapped into this contract. And uh, the, um, so the buyer refused. He said, no, nah, you're outside the scope of this contract, even though it was literally 10 kilos too much wheat and they didn't have to pay for it it was just extra and so this they rocked up it went to the house of lords and 
the court said, go away, something to that effect, because this variance, this amount is trivial. You had a contract and the amount or the fraction that this has been uh, exceeded by is just utterly trivial in relation to this contract itself. And so as such, this de minimis non curate lex, the law does not concern itself with trifle, trifles, trifling things. They, they upheld in that situation for the seller. They said the buyer was being stupid. Again, I didn't phrase it just like that. But they said it was such a piddly amount. The courts don't care. Now, when we teach this, we have to say, use this rule with a great degree of caution in practice. A great degree. I appreciate this was, I said it was 11,000, it was 1,100 or 11,000, I can't remember, either way. Well over 1,000 tons. And it was 10 kilos beyond the acceptable percentage limit. And they didn't have to pay for it. Um, what's 10 kilos a week? Like two or three bags? Um, use this with your, at your peril. Um, but that is kind of the starting point, that a really small amount. So um, when I would teach the MBA students, the example I would use was a florist. Florist has the example, and they say, as part of the contract, um, leave the things at the back of the shop. And the person comes and leaves it at the side of the shop. At the end of the day, that's a trivial thing. It's annoying, but the courts aren't going to accept that if you're going to rock up and say that's a breach because... The contract said you had to do it expressly or explicitly. Um, uh, another example that I give is uh, when doing a journey around Australia, paying somebody to drive all the way around Australia, like that, and they had to pick up the car from your house and they had to drop it off at your house. All right? If they dropped it off three houses down after a trip all the way around Australia, this rule would probably apply in that situation. If they dropped it in the next street, yeah. If they dropped it in the next suburb, that's where, and again, the, the size of the contract matters in terms of things rocking up to, um, rocking up court to do that. The size of the contract really does matter. All right. So one of the really nice things about this, by the way, is that it actually comes across as a little bit logical. I find, that I said, I enjoy this, this content, this lecture, because I find the stuff in my brain anyway it fits with commercial reality in terms of performing contracts. So these rules actually make a little bit of common sense. And I find it interesting when you, you guys will deal with lay people who somehow think that contracts are this great formal thing that is somehow sacrosanct and we're going to hold you to this contract. It's like, no, actually, in this area of law, the courts and um, legal types actually use a fair amount of common sense. As me saying, we don't usually have common sense, but a lot of these rules are. They're logical, and the reason they're logical to us is they try to stop people going to court. That's a really important thing. We don't want people to go to court for essentially silly things that they could have resolved themselves. Okay, and so another mechanism that really helps people resolve things themselves is looking at a contract and seeing whether or not it logically can be chopped up. Can it logically be chopped up? So, um, some examples of that are when you are buying uh, a certain amount of uh, goods that are measurable. Um, again, 10 tons of wheat for $10,000 and they deliver two tons of wheat. How much money should you have to pay? 2,000. It is so simple. <laughs> so simple that this ended up going to the High Court. Um, firewood, in the case of Steele and Tardiani, um, a couple of principles actually come from this. I'll refer to this case a few times. Um, but the first one was that this was to chop up uh, firewood. And the contract expressly said it had to be this amount of timber and they had to be cut to a particular length. Um, had to be a certain amount. Uh, again, I think it was something like 110 tons or something similar. And the length had to be between a certain size, you know, six foot three and 
five foot eleven or something something along those lines. It would have been inches back in those days. And the timber was delivered, but it wasn't the right amount, and some of it wasn't the right length. And so, of course, the buyer, what do they want to do? They want to reject the lot. And the high court, in this case, had a look, and they, they said they applied a few principles here. But the, the, the key one to note from this bit is that in this situation, you're not going to be able to reject the lot. You can reject the bits that don't fit within the size requirements, sure. Um, and one of the judges there also said that we'd, you probably the other side could probably make a claim in equity in terms of relation to that, but I'll leave that until um, later on, next week's lecture. And for the rest of it, though, you know, three quarters of this contract was complete. You pay three quarters of the amount. That's how contract law works. It, you chop things up if you can. Like anything in contract law, though, we can stipulate very clearly in our agreement that things can't be chopped up. Um, you know, again, going back to that Cutter and Powell example, and I'll refer back to that a few times. You can stipulate in the contract, this requires all or nothing. And as we're aware, the way that the courts of common law work, in terms of fairness and uh, power differential between parties, if a powerful party decides to put that into a contract, what's the weaker party going to do? Well, nothing. They're the weaker party. They, they either sign it or they don't sign it. So you could, in a situation like this, have clear stipulations. It must be this much. And you can put that as an express term of the contract, and that's going to trump the divisibility, usually. Usually in that situation. You can make it expressly clear. But usually, this idea of a divisible contract is going to apply. Why? because it can create some pretty grave injustices if you could reject large quantities of things um, and create an injustice on the person, usually the supplier in that situation. Also, one of the reasons the courts favor this approach, they want to be upholding contracts wherever they can. And so one of the logical things they do is to say, look, here is a contract for a person, a builder, to carpet five rooms um, with a certain type of carpet. And let's just say they've done three rooms, and if, you know, assuming the rooms are of equal size, and assuming the entire contract was for $5,000, if the person's done three rooms, then done a reasonable job in the fourth room, but not quite completed it to the required standard, and then not done anything, in regards to the fifth room, well, the courts are going to use a little bit of common sense here. You've done three rooms, pay the $3,000, you've largely done the fourth room, and I'll explain that rule, in, I think it's the next slide. You, you pay for the fourth room as well, less the amount that's required to fix it, and don't pay anything for the fifth room. So it'll be just under $4,000. It's a very logical mechanism for chopping up contracts in situations where the facts let that happen. Courts don't want people, particularly, by the way, builders and tradespeople, courts hate them not getting paid. Um, this is one of the courts of common law hate that. Don't get me wrong, parliaments jumped as well. They're not too happy with subcontractors not getting paid either. And so these days we have a very um, rigid structure of legislative controls for um, building payments. Anna. Yep. 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 And um, not equitable remedies, common law remedies in Hosing and Isaacs and Bolton and Mahinvaiva. Uh, uh, Mat I can't pronounce it. <laughs> I'll start with the top one. Okay. If it's a little bit. The courts use a little bit of common sense. And again, this was a building contract, Honing and Isaacs, and the amount was small. 
And this is where you guys, again, as solicitors, particularly in situations where you're not operating in private practice, but you're offer, operating as in-house. Or if you're operating in entities, in large, medium or large um, entities, where you are part of the decision-making process, in other words, you're part of teams of people who have to make decisions in terms of spending, making contracts, and breaking contracts. It's this logic, which absolutely follows um, what Amanda's just described, that applies. If you have a significant amount of the work done, all right, and I say that substantial performance, this is why it's called the doctrine of substantial performance, if that has happened, the courts prefer to not be the destroyer of bargains. And so if it is a little bit to get a third party to come and fix, the courts say the amount ought to be deducted from the price. And I said, I believe that Honings and Isaacs, I get was in pounds, so it was like 54 pounds, I think was the contract, 52, 54. And the remedial work wasn't much. It was uh, something like 5% of the contract price, plus or minus. There they said, look, you can't reject all of this work. We want to not be the destroyer of bargains. We want to uphold contracts. We say, where a contract has been substantially performed, but there is some minor defect. The courts of common law say, just withhold that amount from the payment. And if you rock, off to, rock up to court, that's how they're going to determine this. And so again, with a building contract, I appreciate this is all common law stuff. Australian consumer law sits on top of consumer contracts, the Fair Work Act sits on top of that, and the Land Titles Act sits on land. There's a whole bunch of stat frameworks that sit over the top of this, but the default rule is common law. If you substantially perform, the other side can withhold a little bit and for you guys, again, particularly those who don't end up in practice but are involved in decision making, this is a difficult decision to make. When you've got a contract and you think they haven't performed it and you either already got a third party to come and fix it, which can usually happen in situations where they say it's done and you've had to go get a third party to do it and you can induce evidence of that, take this amount off this price, but with all of these situations do this with great care reasonable steps take reasonable steps to ascertain these things make sure everything is documented because you run a risk of not paying of being in breach of contract which is a oh the in that situation well again largely that was a really important part of it the the paint job was so bad, it was more this second situation. Um, Bolton and Matt Diva was an, uh, an air conditioning system or a heating system in the UK, and it didn't work. It was erratic. It paid for the heating system to go in, and the thing you know, would periodically break down, have the wrong temperature um, up and down, and the contract expressly said, you've got to install a, a heating system, and it has to function normally. And in that situation, the court said that, look, even though the guys had to go back a few times and, and fix it, right, and the cost, I think they got a third party in to come through and fix it, and the cost was, um, you know, as a fraction of it wasn't large, it was substantial. The, this, the, this amount of work that was required to fix this thing, to get it up to the standard that was required, as per the terms of the contract, it was a big chunk. It was a big chunk. The thing in entirety didn't really work properly. It wasn't like a building that had been largely done and had some minor defects. Functionally, this thing didn't work. Now, even though a fraction of money wasn't huge to fix it, it functionally didn't work. It was not substantially performed. And the court said in that situation, that is not going to discharge the obligations, it's just breach. It is just breach. You can't get by with asking for the bulk of it, less, a small amount, because 
it's uh, it just didn't reach this this level substantive level substantive level of actually achieving what the contract said uh, the parties had agreed to um, again how long is that piece of string these yep yeah, Jordan Contract ends. In this second situation is in bulk, so in Honing and Isaacs, a minor amount. The court said you can pay the contract amount less the cost of reasonable steps to get a third party to fix the defects. Um, that is much more common. Just out of interest, oh, sorry, out of um, to note, this top one is much more common than the bottom one. The courts are reluctant to be the destroyer of bargains. They were forced to in this situation. Bolton and Aunt Deva because the, looking at the contract as a whole, it, the air conditioning system didn't really work. The fact that it would only be, you know, turn off at the wrong time at only a small fraction of the day, and the, the fact that it only cost a relatively small amount to fix, it still didn't meet the um, substantive requirements to perform, uh, to essentially discharge the vendor's obligations in that case. That's it. So this, so I spend a bit of time digesting this because those two rules are, are, are pretty handy to know. The courts don't want to be the destroyer of bargains. The courts want people, particularly tradespeople, to get paid. So at your peril, withhold money from tradespeople. Courts look at that very poorly. Uh, and again, the BICIPA, the Business Industry uh, Construction Payments Act, very carefully goes and structures how subcontractors usually, in terms of large business, business um, arrangements, get paid. And they get paid regularly when they've achieved certain milestones in their work because they want to chop it up. They want people to get paid, and they want people to get paid regularly rather than at the end uh, because that is one of the difficulties of being a tradesperson doing a big job and then at the end, they, the other side says, oh, so we don't want to pay. Because sure, you can go to court, you go bankrupt because you've got no money and you can't feed your kids between the time you can do that. And sure, you win. And sure, you'll get there in breach. And sure, you'll get this. But you've long since gone broke in that meantime. So it's, uh, the, the courts really tend towards encouraging builders and tradespeople getting paid. And uh, so leave that one on the back of your mind. I bet. I love this dream. Thanks, guys. All right. Uh, the rule in Sumpter something, and Hedges. The rule in Sumpter and Hedges. Um, now, I'll note that um, in Steve's lecture, this, this part goes a little bit longer um, because he talks about another mechanism for people to get paid, uh, which we call quantum merit. And we will return to that when I talk about remedies. I'll push that into the remedies part. Here, though, this is what's called the doctrine of part performance or partial performance. And it is, occurs where one person, and here we're thinking tradespeople, have done some work and then not finished. They've buggered off, They've abandoned the contract. Um, which is exactly what happened in Sumter and Hedges itself. It's called the rule in Sumter and Hedges. But somebody has rocked up to build a big shed and they have started doing it. They've put the walls up, they might have started on the roof. Then they've just disappeared. All right, what do you do? What do you do as the owner of the property in that situation? And so the courts, uh, look, not only do they, are they wanting people to get paid, they also don't want people knocking things down and starting again. It seems really dumb. It's very inefficient to do that. So they say that, look, in a situation where one person started to do some work and then they've abandoned it, the other side has come along and voluntarily accepted that work. Usually you do that by getting a third party to come in and finish the job. Finish the job. What happens there is that the courts will say, 
the worker, the, in that situation, the tradesman that did the work up to that point can get paid a reasonable amount, not the contract amount. All right, and they said it's this doctrine of what we call quantum merit. You get paid a reasonable amount. Yep, Martin? Is this the worker that abandoned Yep. That? No, the worker who finished it is a separate contract. Oh. So you have to pay somebody to come and fix it. That's uh, that one there. Or you can do it yourself. Um, Sumter and Hedges, I actually think the owner carried on doing it. Might have got some third parties to do additional work. But I think it largely said, okay, this person's come in, they've built half my shed, and then they've gone away. Uh, and so that person who built half the shed's come back and some says later, the shed's been finished by the other guy. And the other guy said, what are you talking about, mate? You didn't do it, you didn't finish it. Contract in entirety, exact performance required, cover and power. Um, and the court said, well, no, we want people getting paid. But to actually a claim in equity, it's not strictly speaking a claim in common law, not the contract amount. It's just a reasonable sum for work done. I want to call it quantum merit, and I will turn to that because we'll talk about it under remedies. Um, but we, you sometimes hear the phrase, the rule in sumpter and hedges. You've gone and done some work. For whatever reason, you've disappeared. And the other side, and this is this key thing, the, the people who've gained the benefit of your work um, have voluntarily accepted it. If they had no other choice, oh no, there's the stuff here. Well, okay, the, um, you know, what am I going to do from this point forward? Well, I can't easily knock it down and then start again. I guess I'll have to keep it. And don't get me wrong, that's the point that gets argued. When this rocks up to court, oh, oh no, 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 we had to accept it. Well, maybe, maybe not. The person who's seeking the remedy, of course, has, is, has to be one who proves that the other side voluntarily took it. Yeah. So it's an act of equity. Yeah. So Clean hands apply. It's completely yeah, yeah. Good, good thinking. That's right. So sometimes in a situation where they have to do it and have to do it quickly because the other side's disappeared, that you know, may, they may not be able to seek a remedy if it's not voluntarily done. And that reasonable amount is usually, in Australia, is usually regards to your award wages, award wages for such things. Um, so just make note that's inequity. Clean hands applies, delay applies. So if you take too long, you ain't going to get a remedy in equity. Um, but the, the tricky bit with this is the voluntarily accepting work. So just make note, in situations where it looks like somebody has disappeared, um, they've done some work for you, and this could happen in a variety of things. It doesn't have to be building. Um, you now somebody builds you half a website, um, you know, the same rules can, can apply. Most people don't know how the, you know, the doctrine of quantum merit and um, accepting part performance works, but it is nonetheless, it's a rule. There's a rule of contract law. Um, so, okay, I did warn you that this particular part was gonna be short, and this is short. Uh, usually um, wages. You count the, the cost of the building materials and the wage, their time, at whatever the award wage is. That, that's essentially what it is. It's a reasonable amount is the award wage. Um, Australia is a very heavily unionised system um, and the industrial courts. Australia is sort of alone in the world and um, your wages, your awards and stuff were set by courts. Essentially, it was kind of, it's, it's a unique system. Nowhere else has this. And uh, as a result, it's, um, it's relatively easier in a variety of areas of law to actually value people's time as a result, um, both in this law as in others and trusts and things like that as well. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to um, essentially uh, switch the streams over on the, this there. So you can take a break, even though it's a little bit early. And um, we'll come back and we'll talk about the much larger topic, uh, which is discharge uh, through agreements.